Uh, good morning, welcome everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us for the California Experience. California is character, our author panel this morning. It has been a great week of virtual programming so far, and we're really happy to have you with us for this one. Um, I wanna introduce our moderator, Melinda Powers. Melinda is a head book buyer at Bookshop Santa Cruz. There she is, good morning. <laughs> and most importantly to us, she is the Kaliba board president. So there you go. <laughs> so welcome, Melinda. Um, Melinda, Ann, and I have been uh, talking about and planning for this uh, panel for some time. We're all very excited for it. So I am gonna go ahead and let her get started. Great. Well, thank you, Kristen, and welcome, everyone. Um, I am really excited about this panel and bringing this group of authors here today. Um, we just, you know, California is such a big, dynamic state, and it's easy to generalize, but it's also hard to pin down, um, making it an exciting playground to, to write within. And so we brought this diverse cast of authors who are writing both in fiction and nonfiction, and thought it would be fun to kind of bring them together and ask them questions about what it's like to be a California author writing in this place, whether it is the backdrop of a fictionalized story or um, the, um, the, you know, holding the, the, the truth of a personal story or a history that needs to be told. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce each of the authors and they're going to tell a little bit about their book and then I'll ask a question. And then at the end, we'll open it up to kind of a Brady Bunch style Q&A. So please um, leave some questions in the, in the chat so that if you have any for our authors. And um, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. So um, first up is Meredith May. She wrote Loving Edie. You might also know her from her memoir that came out a couple of years ago called Honey Bus, which we also loved. And Meredith, why don't you give us a two minute pitch about your book, essentially. Okay, thank you so much, Melinda. I really appreciate it. This is wonderful. Um, so Loving Edie, it starts in the hurly-burly of San Francisco, and then it ends in the uh, calm, old-growth oak forest in Carmel Valley. And it begins when uh, my wife and I, we get a golden retriever puppy. And uh, this is supposed to bring us closer together as a family. We don't have kids. I mean, we're part of that very specific subculture in San Francisco of like dual income, no kids, uh, dog owners whose social lives completely revolve around our puppy. Um, and actually, I'm not quite sure how much of a subculture that is because dogs outnumber children in San Francisco. <laughs> like the latest count is 118,000 kids and 232,000 dogs. So it's like, we're ridiculous about our dogs. Like we have dog spas, we have Corgi Con on the beach. When my friend's dogs pass, we have memorials. So that's the situation. But uh, we get this dog and she's completely afraid of everything. She has an anxiety disorder and she completely unravels all the promises I made my wife about how awesome it is to have a dog. And all of a sudden we're outside this subculture that I've been a part of for decades. So it's really about... Um, getting over that and learning how to love her because of her disability, not in spite of it. I mean, she's, I mean, the, she's so afraid of everything like sidewalks, ceiling fans, fire hydrants, other people, other dogs, cars, motorcycles, flashlights. So, you know, a Prozac prescription later and a lot of research and a lot of love, uh, our dog forces us to make some life changes and we move to the country which solves some problems, but not all of them. You know, wildfire takes out half the homes on our new street, but not ours. But it's really through slowing down and learning to put her needs before our own, you know, shocker. I, it's like a, my bumpy road toward motherhood and learning unconditional love. So really like who's saving who? So that's it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I should, full disclosure to anyone watching, I was telling Meredith beforehand that I have a six-month-old um, uh, Black Lab who may introduce herself at some point into this, this evening or this morning, I suppose. But um, so I really enjoyed poking into your book. And my question for you, I guess, is in a memoir that is so focused on relationships, both with your wife and also um, parenting this dog and going through all this, how, at what point did you 
pay attention to the place, um, to the places, because I also felt like it was a field, as a dog owner, I felt like it was a field trip into where I should be going to San Francisco and what I should be doing. Like, I was like, now I have to go to Carmel Valley and all of these things. Like, at what point did you insert, like, how did you pay attention to place and setting when you're writing such a uh, relationship situation mm -hmm. as well? Well, that's interesting you asked that because my brilliant editor at Park Row Books, Erica Imrani, on the second pass of the book said, Meredith, where's all the beautiful scenery that was in the honey bus? You know, where is the place? So I had to go back and do a place edit because I was so focused on the dog and my wife and I and how we were just unraveling with this animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I did that, I realized that place was really part of the story. It was part of what soothed my dog, but in turn ended up soothing us. And just watching how she is so sensitive to environment made me realize that we were being insensitive as humans to what we needed ourselves to calm down. So. <laughs> well, it, it definitely it both pieces. Yeah, both yeah. pieces definitely come through. Um, and uh, I really appreciated um, that the, the, the attention to both of those connections, like how, it how where you live matters. Um, and, and here we go. <laughs> yeah, she agrees. <laughs> yeah, she agrees. Oh, boyfriends. Um, I also um, was curious about what the writing, you kind of touched on this, um, but what, what's the difference in the writing experience between the honey bus, which was so saturated in one place in some ways, and then also this um, loving, it, like they feel like two very different, but also bookended you know, pieces of, of memoir. Well, I could kind of hide behind my character in the honey bus, because in that I'm five years old. And uh, it's a 70s California that I'm writing about there, pre-internet, you know, pro gremlin, pro hot tub, like <laughs> cab drinking kind of place. So that was fun to kind of go back and relive that. This, uh, it was really fun to write about San Francisco because it was about at a time where I had been living there 30 years and I was sort of, it was starting to drain me. And so after I, wrote it and, and looked back at the San Francisco I just described and then the modern day car my hometown I came back to my hometown mm -hmm. Carmel Valley what? so to write about it now there were no wineries in Carmel Valley when I was a kid it was really fun to mm -hmm. write about those two places and how how I had to rediscover Carmel Valley right wonderful discover the sounds of it and mm -hmm. the smell of it and and realizing that I do know a lot about nature here, mm -hmm. but I had been so removed from it. I'd been so urban for so long. I now Sorry. own a Carhartt jacket and, and <laughs> boots and, you know, I wear overalls every day. It's like fun to switch. Nice. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And we'll see you at the end. But I wanted to move on next to our next author, T. Jefferson Parker. His newest book is called A Thousand Steps. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring him on so that he can talk about his book. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, um, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me here. It's good to it's good to be on on screen. Uh, my uh, new new book is a thousand steps, and it's a uh, I'm I'm calling it a a coming of age thriller because it's really kind of what it is. Um, it, it it focuses on a 16 year old boy uh, who is in search of his missing older sister, uh, which leads him into the psychedelic underground of Laguna Beach. In 1968, and that's the book. That's the the story uh, in in brief. Um, the reason I wrote set the book in Laguna and, and in 1968 is because I first experienced that vivid spectacle uh, as a 14 year old. Uh, I started going to Laguna Beach. I lived right over the hill in Tustin, so it was easy to get to Laguna. And as a a, a wide eyed um, innocent 14 year old, if you will, it was it, it was it's such a vivid vivid spectacle there you know it was it's a beautiful little town full of you know uh, interesting people eccentrics artists billions of hippies um drugs smoke acid everywhere you looked um free love uh sex drugs and rock and roll and i was 14 and i was kind of gathering all this in i was very much a bystander and not a participant i was just a i was just a kid but you know 
a 14 year old person has a lot of uh, sensory ac acuity. You know, I was I, I, I was really plugged into the, what I was seeing, what I was hearing and what I was smelling and and what people were doing. And, and I, I had no intention at all of being a writer at that time, but I was literally recording that stuff for, for, for future use, even though I didn't know why. So I, anyway, I kind of stumbled into that, that spectacle. I mean, that's the foreground, you know, the background um, in 1968 is, is, it, it wasn't lost on me either as, as a 14 year old, you know, I was watching the Vietnam body counts on, you know, Walter Cronkite, you know, black and white TV news every night, you know, the war was just raging hundreds of, 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 of young men getting killed, Americans there every, every week. Um, Nixon was on the prowl hunting to be the president. Um, all this fantastic, you know, um, you know, strange, strange people, you know, Tim Leary was there in Laguna, um, exemplifying the tune on, you know, tune out, to turn in, tune on, drop out, you know, um, philosophy that he had. And then, then the opposite was there in Laguna too. John Birch Society, very conservative, you know, right wing people uh, of which my father was a mover and shaker. Um, so that was kind of the deep, deeper background in the scene, you know, the protests, the war, Nixon, uh, Leary, um, that world was, was, was background to me. And, and, and so that, that the entire time was, was really important and I, I think very pivotal in, in, in our nation's history. And for that little moment in time, 68 in Laguna, um, it, 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 looked, it looked to me then, even though I wasn't thinking in those terms, and it certainly looks to me now in retrospect a, a, as being um, kind of a fulcrum and kind of a, a magical point of convergence for um, not just Little Laguna Beach and Little Orange County or, or even California, but for the nation. I, we were, our, our, our world was there in, in vivid <laughs> technicolor. And uh, uh, I've been wanting to write this book for decades and that's, that's why. Well, wonderful. Um, I have to say, first of all, you took all of my questions and you just answered it all in your pitch, which is fantastic. Um, but luckily I have more. All and right. also I just have to say, I, this cover is just so evocative of this Isn't book and I love it. Um, Me too. I just, I can't wait to sell this this um, book. I think it's really, it's its own wonderful piece. Um, and I guess as you were talking about all that it is, because what I love about fiction um, done, done this way is it like there's so much to learn and to, to be immersed in how did you choose what to put in and what to keep like what to keep out like how far to go into the time and place of you know Laguna Beach at that time or or how you know when to when to pull back and be like okay let's you know go back to you know my storyline or whatever it is because I just yeah. so much to explore yeah good good question you know my going in position was uh put it all in and worry about it later and so I did when I when I when I had a, no, a notion or a memory or something that I'd experienced, uh, you know, during that time or, or or later, later years in Laguna, whatever it might be, I put it in, I just put it in, put it in, put it in. So this is the longest manuscript I ever wrote. It was 670 pages long, which is long for me. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I, I relied on my fine editor, Kristen Sevick at Forge to help me keep the, 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 the wheat and lose the chaff, you know, so I lost. 200 pages 180 pages I just I just hacked out you know scene scenes and and uh, lo longer descriptions stuff like that and, and so um I, I I hope that I kept the good stuff you know I, I know that I kept the good stuff most of the good stuff is in there and, and when I look back on the um the scenes that I took out I realized that that I was um you know indulging my fantasy or my memory maybe a, a little too much and and thinking that just because it happened that way or could have happened that way and I saw this or talked to this person who remembered that doesn't necessarily justify, you know, a, a, a 15 page chapter. So um, I tried to be, I tried to be tough on myself in, in the, in, in, in the, in the rewrite, you know, mm -hmm. and, and like I said, whittled that down from, you know, 600 plus pages to 550 or whatever it was. Yeah. Nice. It was well, hard. You hate to see those things go. You oh know? yeah. <laughs> I, I can't imagine having to go through and, and pull out some of that. Um, we'll have to see it all. I, I want to see that 672 manu page manuscript. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you at the end of this. And okay. uh, but next, we're going to move on to our next author. Um, our next author is Susan H. Kamei. She wrote, when, when Can We Go Back to America? This is an important work of nonfiction. Uh, for all of you booksellers out there, you might see it both in the um, kids section, but also it equally belongs in the adult section. So do make sure that everybody picks this one up. 
Susan, do you want to talk about your book a little bit, please? Sure. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. And it's such a pleasure to get to be with this amazing group. I'm uh, fans of all your work. And, and uh, Jeff, my family hangs out in Laguna. I guess we were pretty innocent, just playing in the waves. And so can't wait to read it. Um, so my book, When Can We Go Back to America, is about what happened before, during, and after the U.S. government's incarceration of 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry due to racial prejudice because Japan was a World War II enemy. And the incarcerees were forcibly removed from their homes, their livelihoods, their educations along the West Coast. Uh, the vast majority were from California. Um, and then they were detained in these very desolate in, in, uh, interior locations in the in the West. So it's very much a California and, and, and Western story. Uh, so my book does a number of things that hasn't been done before and, and really quite an extensive amount of literature about the Japanese incarceration. Um, first of all, it pulls together how and why this unconstitutional episode took place. Uh, and there's a lot of intrigue in this, uh, going behind the scenes, uh, suppression of destruction of evidence, uh, government cover-ups, uh, the foibles of the decision-making process in government bureaucracies. Um, and I think importantly, it includes first-person accounts into the historical narrative. So you get to really feel uh, what was happening to the individuals, uh, that it really happened and it had real impact. Um, and then I've constructed biographies of the individuals whose voices are in the book. So you can really get to know them as, as people. And I've included material in the text and in an extensive about a back matter uh, that will support teaching. Uh, personal essays, poetry, a timeline glossary, a teacher's guide, uh, extensive uh, primary and leading secondary sources that I curated. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, it's meant to be encyclopedic, um, both for someone who's interested in just learning about it as a, as a general reader, but also hopefully for teachers and, and students and researchers, what is, which is why you'll, you'll see it in, in young adult and in education sections. Um, and then just to, to close out the title, I get asked about the title a lot, and that the title comes from a story that circulated among the incarcerees in camp. And it shows up in newsletters and, and people had different versions of it. But the gist of it is that when the families were uprooted from their neighborhoods and then all of a sudden they're in these assembly centers, these war relocation uh, detention camps, and they're now they're completely surrounded by an all Japanese uh, population. And a child, I chose to make her a little girl, one day supposedly says to her mother, um, mommy, I don't like it here. Uh, uh, she assumes that her parents had taken her to Japan and says, when can we go home? When can we go back to America? And for the second generation that were born in the United States, since this is a personal story for me, and this is my, my parents, my grandparents, their families, um, they wondered as American citizens, when would they have the protection of the constitution and the recognition that citizenship mattered, when would they get to go back to an America of which they thought they belonged? Um, and yet there's all these stories of just amazing resilience and bravery and loyalty, um, and that ultimately um, what was most important to them was to show, even though the government distrusted them to be loyal, that they would do whatever it took to show that they were in fact loyal American citizens. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Susan. And honestly, I uh, thank you so much for doing this comprehensive work. I, um, I, it's, it's been incredible to, to read. I want to also let you guys know, I've been listening to it on Libro FM and the audio is fantastic as well because there's different narrators. And so it, it really brings together this, this, you know, comprehensive account of, of, a, of people, um, which I found was, was really fascinating um, and wonderful. Um, so I guess my, my question, well, first of all, I'll, I do want to point out you guys, it is, it is a thick tome, but it is incredible in the way that it is built um, with the, the biographies of all of the contributors in the back and all of the, the timelines and everything. It's just incredible. Um, uh, my question, I guess, to you is how, this is, this is a harder, this is not so much about the book, but like in a, in a, in a region that has been so affected by this history, but not in the same way as the rest of the United States has because it was a West Coast primarily situation. Like how, how, how do you think that shaped our California? What's one of the ways, I mean, this is too far to get into, but like that this book and this history has shaped 
what our state is and how it how it is now, I guess. How do we move forward from this as, as like a West Coast region in a way that maybe other states aren't? What makes it unique? Yes, so um, within California, there were, there were um, uh, really uh, almost exclusively all of the assembly centers and then two of the war relocation authority camps. So, so Tule Lake at the very north, northern part of California and, and, and Manzanar. Um, but the incarcerees got uh, somewhat randomly got shipped out and, and, and shipped around to, to different camps. And so there, there really is a, 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 another story here about how this impacted the spatial identity of, of the incarcerees, because for the most part, they were not able to return immediately to their West Coast homes, uh, and in many cases, never returned at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there, there's, it's quite complex, you know, in terms of a fabric about how this, how this um, erased important uh, pre-war communities and um, and some other work that I, <laughs> I'm doing in terms of reconstituting those memories from the oral histories and, and the, um, uh, the ability to locate uh, where they were and what was important in communities that got uh, eviscerated and, and not ever reformed after the war. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in terms of, uh, you know, California or, or, you know, regional perspective, I think it's it's like a lot of things that we're discovering about our, our history and our past, right? Is that that there's that there's the things that were unknown, um, and uh, and now that and there were the things that were uh, concealed or or not talked about, um, and so I think um, for us today in California and, and a region, it's it's about discovering a lot of what has been about our past. Um, mm -hmm. You know the 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 recognition, the awareness of, of the Native American um, and indigenous populations and, and uh, you know, just other communities, as this, this relates to as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate um, your work and the, your time with us today. Um, but now moving on um, to our next author. Um, our next author is Rex Pickett. He wrote, his newest book is called The Archivist. It's so shiny and pretty, but it's called The Archivist. Uh, but Rex is both best known for his um, novel Sideways that was turned into um, that, that darling movie, I'm gonna say just a couple of years ago to not make me feel very old, um, and uh, <laughs> which we love. So I'm so happy to see you back with immersive fiction. And Rex, if you wanna talk a little bit about The Archivist. Um, yeah, thanks about Sideways. Actually, it goes all the way back to 2004, but that's cool. But as I was telling you earlier, it's now on a national tour of Sideways the Play in Spain, so I'm very excited about that. But the archivist is a complete departure for me. It's um, about a young 27-year-old project archivist who comes in for one job at a library. I fictionalized guys a library on the University of California campus, San Diego, where I went to school. And she takes over for a predecessor, um, who who died in a supposed accidental drowning and as she gets into as she gets into the collection of this famous author she finds a treasure trove of love letters between her predecessor who had drowned and this famous author and they're both married too and now we get into a lot of kind of interesting ethical issues so what really we as and we actually go back in time so it's really a novel nested within a novel and as we go back in, we get a tragic love story that then actually metamorphoses into a murder mystery. But for me, you know, what happened was, is in 2012, I was up in Hollywood and I'd written three sideways novels and uh, actually two. And I got a chance to go to the country of Chile to write Sideways 3 Chile. And I literally left L.A. I gave up my apartment. I said, I want to be in this barbarous, horrible town anymore. And uh, I've been offered to have my my papers taken at UCSD. And I thought, well, it's cheaper in public story, so maybe I'll drop them off. And I mean, I'm not joking. In fact, I just wrote an article about this the other day. So I dropped them off, me and an intern, like 50 boxes of my writings and my films and everything at a loading dock. And I thought they were just going to put picket on the boxes, whatever. I mean, seriously, I didn't know. And I came back from Chile and they were doing my play at La Jolla Playhouse, which is on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. And they held a dinner in my honor. And a woman came up to me this beautiful woman, and she's, I mean, I still get, you know, kind of emotional. She just, she said, hi, I'm your archivist. You know, I was like, wow. I thought, God, there's a real person behind this. She said, would you like to see what we've done? I said, sure. So I came down into special collections and archives. And this library holds a lot of memories for me because 
uh, going to University of California at San Diego it was a very small school at that time, but there was this huge, gorgeous, brutalist architecture. I mean, it's a, one of the iconic libraries. And I used to often be the only person in there just, you know, reading novels. So she showed me my collection and, you know, seeing all these beautiful document boxes and, and someone who had spent a half a year going through all my work, reading things that I'd never, I wouldn't even dare read, you know, uh, tortured journals of, you know, my Sturmundrang era, whatever. And I, I just realized that, you know, this world had never really been explored. And so I, I literally, and her name is, is Kate Said, and, and we, and she's a kind of a aspiring writer in her own right. So I just started, you know, questioning her. I, I, it was a world I didn't know. I mean, Sideways and its sequels, so that's a world I know. I know the places. Um, but this is a world I didn't know. And when she said something to me about, you know, certain things being out on the dark archives on these dark servers, that's like, for me, a flare went off in my head. I thought, oh, there's all this stuff hidden out there. So I started, you know, really researching the archival world and archivists and who they were you know, uh, and what they did, they work in anonymity, we don't, you know, we're, we're used to, it. it's, it's a thrill, it's a mystery, you know, and I love mysteries, and for me, I, again, at the risk of immodesty, I don't want to pretend this, but I'm a huge fan of the English patient, because I love tragic love stories, I really do, I'm a huge fan of Chandler's The Long Goodbye, I love mysteries, but that's a mystery that went to another level, it's really about, um, it's, it's really about betrayal more than it is, a, it is a whodunit. So I think this, I try to do a marriage of those two and it deals with ethical issues inside the archival, archival profession, but it really is a love story and somebody who is holding on to this very compromising material and an author who's kind of washed up, which I guess was maybe me and at the time. And I, I needed something new. I needed a new world. And also to write about two women characters was, was, uh, it just it was a huge departure for me and it ended up being also a really big book so it really for me everything for me starts with something i've experienced i mean with sideways i bared my soul i literally just emptied myself when i wrote that book and um and so it 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 was just entering a new world with actually a kate in fact i want to and i actually wrote it as an eight uh, part uh, limited series and when i got done with it it was like 530 screen pay, screenplay pages and I got a call from Rick Blywise of Blackstone, and he said, Rex, we're a publisher now. I said, well, I've just written an eight-part miniseries based on a novel I didn't write. So could I write that novel? And he goes, sure. So I kind of went backwards. So the, the miniseries is already written. Hopefully, you know, get made. It'll be a continuing series. Because I, I, it's just, a, we, you know, we're so used to cops and lawyers and doctors and forensic analysts and serial killers. I wanted a mystery that was just so, so different and, a, and characters who hadn't really been explored. And I got into that world of archivists and, and whatever. And, and, and then the imagination just starts to pullulate from there, you know. And that was it, but it was really my papers being taken and being really almost um, just emotionally overwhelmed by the experience mm -hmm. of seeing your work. You go up one day to LA with five boxes and you come back with 50 boxes, no wife, no children, nothing. That's your life. And there it is laid out for you. And the tears fogged my eyes when I was in there. And, and for me, I look for the emotion. I'm always looking for the emotional spine, that thing. And because I think that people, that resonates with people and that. That was the inspiration for it. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I, I think you can really feel that when you're reading the book. Um, once again, your explanation just kind of took all the questions that I possibly had. Um, but we do have, and I, I do need to keep us moving along just a little bit, but I did have a question about, in because this book is so different in its like kind of noirish feel and it's dark, like, did you find yourself writing place differently to, to try to evoke different feelings at all than you would have like when you're doing sideways, you know, or in, in that type of project? Did that no, come I, differently? No, for, for me, like in sideways, you know, if I'm at the hitching post, you know, I'm, I'm there because I've been there so many times, you know, everywhere I'm at, I, I like, for me, you know, a couple of times I've, you know, been, uh, I don't know, uh, commissioned to write a screenplay about a world I don't know, and I just mm -hmm. completely get lost. And like the library, I've been there so many times. And and like literally right now where I'm sitting, the main character, Emily Snow, this is where she lives, right where okay. I'm sitting. And so I know this place, there's a, the beach is right down there. She goes down to the beach. I mean, I, I, I like to know the world. Right. Well, you can really tell as you read it. So thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. Um, all right. So I'm going to move us on. Our next author is Susan Strait. Her book, her newest book is called Mecca. And I can't wait to, um, to hear more, or I mean, I can't wait for her to tell us about it now. 
um, and also this gorgeous cover as well. And I was reading a little bit about where that came from. So um, Susan, take it away. Hi, it's so nice to be with you all. Um, I always make my list of all the books I wanna read. And um, actually I got to see T. Jefferson Parker's early cause he sent me and that cover too. And just to think about all these landscapes we're writing about, um, for me, I've been writing about California for my whole life. I'm, I'm 60 now and I wrote my first short story, uh, I was 16 and I wrote this very noir thing set in the desert because my family used to go to Coachella all the time before it was Coachella, like back when it was Joshua Tree and there'd be scorpions at the bottom of our sleeping bag and we would be looking for dead bodies. So I would have to say this sort of brings me back to what I'm thinking about with Mecca, which is that it's my love letter to California. It's a dark love letter, no doubt. But in 2009, I started writing about this character named Johnny Frias. And he's based on a friend of mine named Louis Lozano, um, who wanted to be a, a CHP motorcycle officer. And he always, and he's from Corona, and he always said, I wasn't allowed to do that. Instead of being a cop, I got beat up by the cops. And this just stayed with me. And also, I've lived in the same place my whole life. So everyone stops by and tells me stories about like how you can, you know, box with someone with three punches. That would be all it would take. Or someone will tell me about like the secret life of opossums. With Johnny Frias, um, I, I wanted also to write a character who's between worlds. Johnny Frias is sixth generation Californian, but he's Moreno, so he's dark skinned. And this comes from friends of mine who during certain periods in the last six years were told to go back to Mexico. And they would respond with, I've never even been to Mexico. My family got here in like 1843. I grew up with a family called the Trujillos. We went to high school together and their family did come to Riverside County and San Bernardino County in 1843 um, to guard the California's cattle from being rustled. So all these things came together in Mecca. And also I love the sort of the multiple narrator um, story like uh, Susan was talking about. I, I had Johnny Frias in mind. Um, he is the descendant of the Anza crossing, which is two miles from my house. Um, I live right near the Santa Ana River in an old Orange Grove farmhouse. So I'm always walking to that crossing, the Anza party crossed in 1772 um, from Mexico, made it to there, and then went on to San Mission San Gabriel. So Johnny Frias lives in a remote canyon um, along the Santa Ana River. Um, actually, Jeff <laughs> lives near Tustin, Fullerton, Placentia, Yorba Linda, and that whole Santa Ana Canyon is home to some of the busiest freeways in America. So having him be a California highway patrolman, um, I also have a lot of friends who have been um, in law enforcement and a lot of friends who are nurses. So I ended up having Johnny Frias be between Spanish and English, between the law and between murder and between what people's notions are of what it takes to be a man and Having grown up on a rancho, he grows up in a place where they still run cattle. His dad is a vaquero. So it's between Harleys and horses, between Spanish and English, between gun smoke and like right now. Um, but he commits a, a murder um, to try to stop a man from raping a woman. And so to me, the other notion of this was how one death and one baby can change everyone's lives for 30 years. So that murder takes place 20 years ago. The second main character is Ximena. She just crossed the border from Oaxaca into Calexico. Um, that meant crossing the All-American Canal. And that's also based on a true story. I have a friend who, when he was crossing the border, um, he was only 17, came from Guatemala. And his brother who was 16 drowned. And he's 40 now. We've known each other that long. You can hear me um, become a little emotional because he's really never recovered. He's been here in this country um, since he was 17 and he's now 40. And if I were to ask him about his brother um, in Spanish right now, he would still cry. And so I keep thinking about, again, the one death that sort of changes the trajectory of your life. Ximena lives in um, Mecca. It's the, the Mecca that we have, which is state gardens and agricultural fields and vineyards. And that was inspired by this trailer park um, that I've been to many times that's on um, tribal land in, in Coachella. And just this vibrant community that people have made. 
um, people who just arrived or people who have been in that park for a long time. And most of those people are indigenous. And the third character, um, who's a main character, is Marilas Rodriguez. And she's, um, she was in uh, previous books that I've written. And she's a single mom, and she works at Conroy's um, Flores. And I have to say that all of a sudden COVID intruded on my book in so many ways, because Marilas is one of five female friends, and the other four became nurses. And so all of these women and the men who are in the um, group with Johnny Frias, they all met when they were only 20 years old at Anza Crossing. And again, it's usually one death that changes everything. And Madalas, um, being a single mom, is trying to find out um, secrets in her past. And everyone ends up in Coachella, in the Coachella that I know, which is not, <laughs> not the music festival, but deep in Mecca. Um, and so that's why that cover meant a lot to me, Melinda, because Rodrigo Corral did the cover. And it's just, it's beautiful because if you look at it, I know this, this sounds crazy, but the bottom is what means the most to me. This is like this little ragged edge where you can see like the old grasses and the foxtails and the tumbleweeds. And that's the part of California that is my California. It's the edge of California. It's like where you find the thing that you need to find, whether it's a piece of glass or whether it's somebody who had been buried. So thanks for letting me talk about it. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. And honestly, I um, I, I don't even know if I have quite, a, your book is so immersed in place. Um, the only thing I wish, and I don't know if it's in time because it's in March, is I, I would love a map in here <laughs> from someone who is not from Southern California. It is like, it is so in place that I want to actually be able to see it on a map so I can better understand how it all works. But I love um, traveling through the canyons and everything. Um, and I, um, I, I actually don't, I, I don't really have a, I guess I, my question really was about the cover, but then I kind of asked you in the beginning. Um, so I, I guess my question really quick, and I, we are just to put it out there, you guys, it is 940 and you guys are wonderful. Um, so I, if we go over just a tiny bit, I hope that's okay. Um, or, or I'll just answer all the questions for you guys afterwards. Um, but I guess I was just wondering how, when you are, um, when you are, evoking a place, how you um, make, sh like, how you hold all of those stories and the place at the same time and make sure that it is um, telling the whole story, I guess, for you. I don't know if that really makes sense, but like, I feel like you've done so much research on, on the stories that you, like first person accounts that you've gathered from your friends and from the community that you've been in for so long, but how do you also do that with place? Do you, um, is it basically just your experience and your memories or do you also like research through the, the, the history of the area? It's so yeah. funny that you asked that because I'm, I'm, I mean, I write, I still write by longhand, you know, I, I write, this is embarrassing, but everybody hates, you know, cars right now and freeways, but I'm from here, from here. And so like our whole life is cars, it's classic cars. You know, my friends drive Harleys, a friend of mine just died on his Harley going 90, um, three months ago, 500 people showed up for the funeral and we made um, tacos. And just to sort of think about, I drive, girl, that's how I do it. Like I drive to Coachella all the time and I just hang out and people just tell me their life story. I have that face. And so people tell me how they drive from San Bernardino to Coachella every day just to set up all the chain link fencing for the music festival. And then they end up telling me how they got here from Guanajuato. They tell me about their wife and kids. We're standing out there and there's a guy installing 200 porta potties and he tells me about when he crossed the border. And that's just not hard for me I, because I think the main part about being a good writer is to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. And so I have to tell you, I ride in my car because I have three kids, they're grown now and I was a single mom. But even like my ex-husband came over the other day and he's like, brought me this little notebook. He brings me these little notebooks from the 99 cent store. Cause he's like, I know you're writing in your car and I don't want you going off the road. He said, I don't want to, I don't want to be raising grandkids by myself. So I write in the car I have since I was 16. And that's what helps me because I know like what a Bougainvillea looks like when it's mm -hmm. spilling over a freeway wall, or I know what the, where the, the Santa Ana river sort of bends. And um, yeah, that means a lot to me. Oh, I write in my car wonderful. still. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan. Well, last, but certainly not least. And um closest both in proximity and also probably to my heart just because um because I, this, or, sorry 
what I should say is our final author is Jaime Cortez. His book is called Gordo and it is a collected, um, a collection of, short, of kind of linked short stories to some extent. Um, and he's writing um, about um, within the, uh, the Salinas and Watsonville um, area, which is very close to Santa Cruz, which is where I'm from, which is why I'm so excited to have him on this panel today. But Jaime, please take it away. Oh, but you're on mute. Uh, any year now, I will remember to unmute myself when it's time to speak. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's great to hear about these wonderful new books coming out. Um, my name is Jaime Cortez, uh, and uh, my uh, Gordo is my debut collection of semi-autobiographical stories, which are kind of linked. Um, as Melinda mentioned, it takes place in and around uh, Steinbeck, Steinbeck country. Uh, most of the stories are uh, have children as protagonists, and in particular, uh, the narrator of many of these stories is Gordo, who is kind of based on me uh, growing up uh, in uh, migrant farm worker camps uh, in San Juan Bautista, and then later in the agricultural town of Watsonville, California. Uh, Gordo is, uh, the stories in Gordo are uh, kind of by design, very uh, kind of based in humor, but also tragedy. So it's definitely the tragic comic uh, kind of mix that I was pursuing here. Um, Gordo is, uh, uh, the, as I said, he's the, the first person voice in many of the stories. He's a chubby kid. Uh, he is a very naive kid, but he's also full of the kind of wisdom and insight that an observant child can have. Uh, he doesn't know he's gay yet, but he knows that the way he acts and the things he feels don't seem to sit right with the world. So he's just kind of starting to figure something out there uh, where these stories uh, take place. Um, and I'll leave the introduction at that. Well, thank you so much, Jaime. I really appreciate it. And um, I guess my question to you, and you kind of mentioned it because it is it is set in what is kind of widely known currently as Steinbeck country. And I guess I was wondering how how aware, I mean, I imagine you were, how aware or who is your audience in writing this book? Because to me, this um, this needs to sit alongside or rather in front of of some of those works because it is, it is equally um, as evocative of this area of land. And I just was wondering, how um, how you were thinking about that as you were writing the pieces or or at what point? You know, it, it's interesting. Um, it's very tempting to kind of retrospectively talk about the audience for the book because I, I, I now understand that it's finding an audience that's much broader than I initially imagined. But uh, really um, the, the writing process for me is kind of a remarkably self-absorbed process. I'm, I'm just trying to delight myself. I'm trying to remember, to, to savor those memories and remember them again. Uh, of course, when I think about who would probably be most kind of connected to it, it would be any, you know, people who have lived in this area, people who have experienced life on, uh, uh, in farm worker settings uh, in California. Um, uh, but, but, but yeah, I, I think I don't tend to think in terms of audiences as I'm writing. I'm just thinking about what's the story that feels delicious to me. Uh, and then I pursue that. Well, it's all delicious. It's, uh, it's so clear that you're writing with joy and um, intimacy about, you know, informed by your past. And it, it just, it infuses the book to the reader and to the landscape. And I really just appreciate that. Um, and I don't know, Valentina, if we bring everyone back onto screen now or if everyone has been on screen this whole time, in which case, hi, everyone. Um, but I did want to, it's 946, but I did want to give an opportunity to bring all of us together because um, I'm so appreciative of the time you've given us today um, to kind of look at different ways that we see um, our great state. And I wanted to, uh, to leave one last question that is kind of an easy farewell for you all. And that is, if you wanted to shout out or just um, talk about or one of the one of your favorite California indie bookstores, um, that be I think that'd be a fun way to end this this uh, um, mm -hmm. session. There you go. That's the word. <laughs> go for it. Unmute and just play I, ball. I can start. Um, <laughs> I remember writing a love letter to independent bookstores and trying to sell it to the LA Times in 1995 because I was on tour and my favorite bookstores were back then Black Oak Books, 
which is gone now, but gosh, I love, I loved Dutton's, which is also gone now, but right now, love Bookshop Santa Cruz, love Skylight, <laughs> boy, Skylight really just um, one of my favorites, and I love, love, love Mysterious Books in, in Orange County. So, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, ditto oh. that, you know, I, I, I would add Warwick's to the list for me, uh, here in La Jolla, just love them. Book Carnival in Tustin is always one of my my favorites, and uh, and and I love Laguna Beach Books. Cool little story. Awesome, absolutely. Susan, I saw you. I'm from Pasadena. Vroman's all the way. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> Meredith. I think I saw your. Yes, I have uh, three in Monterey County. Um, Olivia and Daisy in Carmel Valley. We oh, haven't had a bookstore cool. in 40 years. And um, Olivia and Daisy are named after the owner's donkeys, which they bring to the store on occasion. Now I have to come yeah. visit. Yeah. And uh, Pilgrim's Way in Carmel is mm -hmm. rocking. They have a whole like crystals and plants and, and you know, tarot cards, uh, guard, secret garden behind the store. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you really want the Big Sur California experience, the Phoenix shop at um, Nepenthe restaurant. Just can't Absolutely. Be. Awesome. Thank you. Um, um, I'll go oh, yeah, Jaime, yes, please. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'll call out two uh, bookshops. Um, one of them is Bookshop Santa Cruz, which is a place uh, that, that's deep in my memory. I first uh, began going there when I was an adolescent. Uh, so it's, uh, I have so many memories of just picking up all kinds of books there over the years. Uh, and then uh, here in Watsonville, our local bookshop, Kelly's, um, is fantastic. Uh, and, you know, in, in some communities, the, the bookshop is such a, a lighthouse um, because there, there's not uh, necessarily a bunch of other sort of cultural amenities to be had. Mm -hmm. So the bookshop takes on this great importance. Yeah. How I feel about. Um, oh, thank you. I used to go to maybe maybe uh, Jeff remembers this, but I used to go to a little bookstore in La Jolla called Mithras, and you would walk in, and around the back it was a movie theater called the Unicorn Movie Theater. Mithras now, and I don't know if this is a Harbinger or where we are today. They now sell Lamborghinis. That's what they've done. My launch is at Warwick's, Jeff. So, but I used to troll bookstores. I used to go to sometimes two. I was so lonely and alienated. I would just go and look for books. I remember at Mithras, I went in, I got a a settlement from a, a car accident. And I went in and bought the entire collected works of C.G. Hume, all 20 volumes. Mm -hmm. And I went home and took me six months yeah. to read. So it's sad. A UCSD bookstore is still there and mm -hmm. we're doing an event there. So wonderful. I love UCSD bookstore. Great. Yeah. Well, there are wonderful, wonderful bookstores. And next time we all talk, which because I think this was so much fun, we should do it again. Um, I want to hear the next three bookstores that you guys have visited and loved, and I'll share mine as well. <gasps> oh, and it's Edie. Oh, it's Edie. Edie. Uh, <laughs> Hi, everybody. There she is. I've been I've been taking notes of all the stores, so I got them all. I think I got everybody's. This, that that is so fun to hear. Um, to hear the places that you guys all treasure, because I'm sure many of us feel the same way or have worked at some of those places. So that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, thank you all so much. Thank all you. of you, uh, you. The authors, thank you guys you. have been just absolute rock stars. We appreciate you so much. And Melinda, thank you, thank you for your time and energy. She she had a lot of reading to do um, <laughs> and, and she did it and we appreciate her so much. So thank you everyone. Um, just wanna give you guys a couple quick announcements. Uh, recordings for all of the virtual sessions will be up on our website. Uh, some of them are up now, some of them will be up in a few days. Um, Valentina has been working really hard to get everybody's, uh, to get all the recordings up so you'll be able to find those. And the website is KalibaAlliance.org. So check those out. If some of the booksellers in your stores weren't able to attend this morning, please be sure to have them check out the recordings. Um, also galleys, uh, we, we dropped uh, links to the galleys in the chat. So be sure and look for those. Also visit our virtual exhibit hall and galley gallery. That can be found at kaliba-annex.org. Good stuff in there. Uh, we have two other wonderful events on tap today, uh, both continuing the California theme. Uh, one we're very excited about at noon, we have a poetry panel moderated by uh, John Evans of Diesel, a bookstore. And uh, we're so excited about this one. It's really, really going to be great for poetry people but probably even better for folks who just aren't quite sure how to hand sell poetry collections. And so this is gonna be a really, really interesting discussion with three amazing poets, uh, California poets. So please check that out at noon. 
And then uh, last but not least, our final virtual programming at six tonight, we have the announcement of our Golden Poppy winners. So that is gonna be really cool. Be sure and tune in for that at six o'clock, followed by a People's Guide panel uh, moderated by Kim Robinson, who is the editorial director of the University of California Press. So that's at six o'clock tonight. Again, it's all about California today and you guys really kicked it off in a major way. So thank you all of you so much for being here and everyone take care. <laughs>